such sights to show you. Hey folks, it's just me today as Todd is feeling pretty sick. He's got a bad cold. So get well soon, Todd. Hope you get fixed up and uh, back on track as soon as you can. Uh, so it's just me this week. Um, I, I've got a great interview here uh, with someone who is actually the first person that I ever got in touch with with regards to makeup effects years ago. And I still have my letters from 1990 uh, when Jeff Portis replied to my questions when I was just 16. Uh, I sent him all kinds of stuff. I sent some foam samples, from some foam latex that I made at home with a handheld whisk. Uh, with this foam latex kit which I had which was terrible uh, but I sent him a piece and I asked him questions about this and the makeup that they used and uh, through all these letters and things that I sent to him he replied every single time um, and I remember that and I, I, I spoke to him about it and, and told him that and it meant a lot to me and it's one of the reasons why I feel so strongly about um, you know helping people when they have questions because I know what it feels like when you when there's something you really want to know and either you don't know how to articulate the question or it's just something that you you know you just can't find someone to answer so um i attribute that really that kind of thing to that 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 feeling i had when i had these questions and he answered um it's amazing i also remember actually meeting when i was at college i went to wilburton school of art years ago um i graduated in 95 so this would have been 92 93 when i started um i remember meeting uh, nick dubbin who came in and he was teaching the prosthetics part of our course uh then and uh, i basically cornered him for about half an hour he wasn't even teaching my class he was teaching the year above and uh, i had all these questions i'd be reading you know in uh, and Gorzone and Fangor and I just accumulated all this information and all these questions and I didn't know anyone bearing in mind this was pre-Google um, I had all these uh, questions and, and things I wanted to know so I basically uh, called it and said oh I've got these questions can I speak to you and he was uh, this was you know early 90s so he was not that long after he'd done uh, the Joker on Jack Nicholson for the first Batman and uh, yeah, he basically answered all my questions. It was amazing. And uh, I just remember feeling like I, th I came out walking on air after I'd spoken to him. He's had all these questions that have been burning a hole in my brain for years. And I didn't know anyone else that uh, even knew what I was talking about, let alone who could answer my question. So um, it was really, really cool. So to, to people like that who, you know, took time to answer my questions and knew what I was talking about as well. Um it was a really cool thing, so uh, I, I appreciated that. Anyway, so I, I drove up to Jeff's place and we chatted for a good few hours about stuff. And uh, this interview with Jeff Portis, I had to split into two separate casts because we did so much chatting, there was so much material. Um, and it seemed to fall into two logical topics. So the, the, the first part, which is this part, is, is all the film stuff. And the next part, part two, will be about the teaching stuff. So this is part one, uh, which looks at the film stuff. Uh, and like I say, the next issue, uh, the next episode will be uh, next week we'll be covering the next stuff just a quick mention of uh, some new workshops by the way that i'm doing uh, i'm uh, coming up at pinewood in the next few months so keep an eye out for announcements and dates on my workshop page of my website which is learnmakeupeffects.com forward slash workshops that's where i'll be posting my stuff uh, there will be dates and booking info on there in the next few days i haven't had time to update that yet because it's been crazy doing stuff um, but uh, yeah i am doing some workshops people have been asking um, so i shall be doing some soon um, okay so let's go and chat with jeff uh, and discuss vaginas and throats dildos on bedposts and uh, the other things that went into a movie that at one time may have been titled s m demons from beyond the grave I think that may have been a working title, or maybe that would have uh, been a better one, but uh, it ended up being called Hellraiser in the end. So uh, let's go and chat to Jeff about that. How much I'm time have you got to watch TV? This is it. <laughs> I want to retire so I can just watch day, you know, a series a day or something. Oh, but... God. Can you imagine? I then you to... would be binge watching. But when I was a kid, that's why I got into movies, because I was, when I was a kid, I watched films, and we didn't have video in those days. Yeah. So Christmas was my, when you know, Christmas came early, so Christmas came at Christmas, it was five films a day, and I'd, I'd map the radio times out so I could channel hop, and just, if I knew a film, I'd just, oh, just lose the, you know, and I'd watch films all day. Yeah. Now, of course, it's the thing is you can do it without that, and it's just a nightmare. Yeah. So, but I don't watch half as much TV as we used to. 
Just don't. So uh, I basically just want to uh, skim through a little bit about how you started out doing, ended up doing what you did. And then um, we'll just talk a little bit about image and the movies that happened and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm more interested in, 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 in the, the um, like, like the monsters and, the, and the, the, how things are created and that side of things. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to pick apart business relationships yeah. or I'm, I don't think anyone else is interested. It's, it's more about the, um, the art of it, for want of a better word. I mean, I remember I got um, the book when it came out, you know, with all the the monsters in it and all these creatures. That, from Nightbreed. From Nightbreed. Oh. And it was like, oh, my God. And then I think uh, the first time I'd seen the word prosthetic ever was um, reading a gore zone, I think it was. And there was an interview and there was a guy with the, the hooks in his cheeks. And um, they did an interview with one of the actresses who'd done a, a painting. And there was one of the, I can't remember the girl that was in it, but... Uh, Anyway, it was it was all new to me, and it was like, oh, I didn't know what prosthetic was, and I looked it up in the dictionary, and uh, yeah. Whenever I'm talking to anyone that does it, I like I'm an, I, I reflect in my head how I kind of crept into it, and you know, reading magazines and, and slowly drifting towards it. But I don't know if your experience was the same, where you always like monstery things, or you like movies, or how you ended up doing it or did you find yourself doing it yeah no, how did this happen no okay so I mean, the thing is i always date myself is the thing is that i've said it before um is the thing is that 1969 i was nine okay born in 1960 so i don't care anymore um the thing is it's just sort of 1969 2001 comes out yeah and whilst i'd been as a kid i was interested in science fiction and fantasy and things like that it's you know when you're eight or nine you don't really do that much but i'd read magazines uh and i'd started reading arthur c clark and things like that so when 2001 came out, to me, that was it. And yeah. that said, this is what I'm into. And even when I was nine, I understood the movie. Then I read the book and then I understood the movie a little bit more, et cetera, et cetera, and got into that. So what I started doing was was just sort of like looking around at other things. And because the thing is, I'm from the generation that, that grew up with Hammer Horror. Yeah. So the thing is, you go back to 57 for the, the Hammer Horror, Frankenstein, et cetera, et cetera, then the, and the Draculas, and then all the way through the 60s into the late 60s and the early 70s when they sort of fizzled out with the, the vampires thing, and the, the mm-hmm. legend of the seven golden vampires, that kind of stuff. And I got totally into it, so I started buying magazines and all the bits and pieces. And then I sort of got into the horror and the blood and guts and threw a bit of blood around when I was a little kid. But most of the time, I was just sort of like playing and the one thing that I did that for my eternal shame was um, I bought Dick Smith's Monster Makeup Handbook. Uh-huh. I've still got an original copy somewhere, an original uh, sort of like first run copy or whatever, and copied some of the bits and pieces from that and did a few things on. I'd sort of like do little acid burns on people, etc., etc., and school friends and things and bits and pieces. And then I started sort of like sculpting um, heads on my action man <laughs> in blue tack. Maquette. In blue tack. <laughs> yeah. I, I copied Frankenstein's monster. I did a gory one. I did a mummy. Uh, and then photo- I've still got the pictures somewhere in the back of beyond. So I've no idea where. But the thing is, I, I took pictures on this. was on about 11 or 12. Wow. Um, and I sculpted and painted them. In That's a really paints. good idea. Well, it was the just, head's there. It's yeah. basically just modifying And I just it. added to it and things like that. And I chopped a few of his fingers off just for the effect, etc. Um, and just did that. Um, this is when Action Man had, like, flocked hair? Yeah, no, or before or flocked before, hair. Okay. Before, so he had the plastic hair, so it was easy to sculpt on. Okay. And Blue Tack's not the easiest stuff to sculpt on. But I no, didn't. no. Plasticine was too hard. Mm-hmm. Whereas Blue Tack, I could warm it up and stretch it across. And I started doing little effects. If you stretch Blue Tack, it, it cobwebs. Mm-hmm. I don't think you've ever tried it. It's really yeah, weird. Yeah. And I was doing little effects with that on people's skin and things. And I just played and then got with Dick Smith and then went through there and then did art at school. So art was my big thing at school. And I was a trustee, so I could sit at the back and I did a little bit of sculpting, but we didn't really do sculpting. It was more painting. Did my art O-level. And then in 77, when I was 17, so I'd done my O-levels, I was doing my A-levels, and Star Wars comes out. Yep. So Star Wars was the big sort of like thing that kicked off the sort of science fiction revival. And then kicked into play all these, you know, the Star Trek revival, Black Hole, all these kind of things around the late 70s. Yeah. And that was what really then kicked it off for me again. So I then applied to do uh, a course, a graphic design course. And back in those days, before you were born, I still think. I was 73. 73. So just you were, <laughs> Wasn't you were long behind running you. around. <laughs> but the thing is, it's just sort of that you didn't have all these courses like we have now. I mean... I think almost a, a slightly ridiculous number of courses, not just in makeup but in, in art in those terms, mm. in the sense that you had two courses. You had fine art and graphic design, mm-hmm. and that was it. And I've always said that the way you look at it is that fine art is your passion is from here, your heart. Mm-hmm. Graphics is here, your head. 
Mm-hmm. You're solving other people's problems. Yeah. So if somebody comes to you and says, I want to sell this product, I want to do this, I want to get this emotion across. As a graphic designer, that's what you do. Mm. And whilst I enjoyed doing a bit of painting, I did, I, when I was 15 or 16, I sold a few paintings to people. Just you know, I, I put little ads in, say, oh, I can do portraits and pictures of people's houses and things. And I did a few of jets of RF Connings being things for people and made a bit of money out of it. Um, but I never really did much else. Right. And so I thought, okay, look, I'm, I'm not really a fine artist. I'm not sort of, you know, I didn't, I didn't have that much teenage angst to get out onto canvas or whatever. So I did graphics, and I, I bypassed the um, the foundation course, as they were then, which was the idea that you tried everything. Mm-hmm. But I went to Leicester, what was then Leicester Polytechnic, it's now De Montfort University, and they, so I went there, and the guy said, oh, this is interesting, and they took me on straight off. Over three years, I did graphics, and halfway through the course, they changed. Um, the head of school was fired for um, basically making sexual advances to some of the students, the female <laughs> okay, students. Not the right thing. And they brought in a man called Peter Ray, who died last year uh, from the Royal College of Art. And he was brilliant because he wanted to revolutionise and play. So when I showed him my pictures of all my plasticine dinosaurs and my little spaceships, I was into building. I was doing everything, not just makeup. So I was doing animations and I was building spaceships. I built a, a four foot long spaceship model with all kit parts all over it and things, which I eventually sold to Central TV wow. for one of their kids' TV shows. <laughs> have you um, ever seen it? That yes, you have. Yeah. Oh, it was on TV two or three times in no two way. or three old shows. Yeah. Oh my gosh! How um, is and that? it took me about a year to build. And I there was so. I mean, I can I could point out all the little bits of kits to you and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I learned to airbrush and then add little bits and pieces <clears> and cut out little details and stuff and loved it. I bet you it's it was on eBay for millions of pounds now. Uh, no, no, no. They. <laughs> To be honest, they, it caught fire. They, they accidentally left it one place and it caught fire one day. They left it too close to a light oh, no. and it, it, it's long gone. But, um, no, it was, that was great fun. So the thing is, I did that. And the, my, this head of school saw it and he said, well, why don't you do this? I said, can I? He said, yeah. So I spent the last year of my university course writing a thesis about called Star Wars and the Renaissance of Science Fiction Cinema, talking about my love for 50s science fiction and then the re sort of like working of science fiction back in the 70s when star wars started and comparing the two and then building finishing this model spaceship and doing what was called a tape slide we didn't have all this video technology then on iphones and stuff and it was like a, a two slide projectors projecting dissolving images across okay so i started off with a star wars flyover with a spaceship going da, 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 with a big soundtrack i got to do a 16 channel track mix in the sound studio we had there we shot um, location work with some actors at Castle Dunnington Power Station with their okay. control room standing in as the bridge of this ship. And then I airbrushed all the photos with stars and lasers and God knows what, and did a big 10 minute long little movie wow. made out of coloured slides, <laughs> which was sort of like, you know, when you put it in the, in the projection suite, you know, it would, and it just knocks your socks off. It was mm-hmm. fabulous. Did that. I did a, um, I'll show it to you at some point. I did a, 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 a plasticine dinosaur thing with knocking down stones and stuff. Loads and loads of stuff. Came out with a first class honours degree, you know, so, you know. And you enjoyed, you know, you had fun. Oh, you, were, you were just indulging in Yeah. It. But working hard, but it was an indulgence. It was, yeah. it was coming from here. Yeah. Not from here. Exactly. To the heart. And just, and just <clears> loved <throat> it. Mm-hmm. Left that. Went to live in London, and that would have been in 81. And then over the course of two years, did little jobs. Um, I, was, I, was, I was taken on. I've, I've got what apparently is a very, very good colour sense. If you show me a colour, I can mix a colour to match that colour, that, that wall or that one, virtually precisely. Mm-hmm. There's a colour test apparently where you put 100 coloured blocks out <coughs> through from one end of the spectrum to the other, and I got two wrong. Right. And it's very, very small differentials. I think you see them on Facebook, these colour tests yeah, where you yeah. have to pick out the side. And I got quite high into the thing, with, so I could do that. And I got taken on Warner Brothers. Their shops in the high street would call me because they got these big fiberglass statues of Roadrunner and things. When they got damaged, they'd pay me 100 quid just to go in and sort of put a bit of car filler on and match the paint and just paint it over. Yeah. You know, I was, I was on, on the dole, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I was doing bits and pieces, small jobs here and there, et cetera, and things like that. And then one day I then got, oh God, you really want to hear all this? I do. Uh, I then got, right, I went down to the BBC and got offered um, an interview there. Would um, this be down at the BBC TV Centre? Or well, no. It, West, it, it was actually no. It was actually where London College of Fashion is now. Oh, right. It was still part of the BBC then. How strange. Or very close to it. And I got back on the train at Goldhawk Road, right. and I left my portfolio at the station. Got one stop along, went back, it had gone. 
Okay. And this was going to another interview. Uh, then what was called, uh, what was one, it was also called Hallison Bachelor. Okay. You remember Hallison Bachelor? They made the animated version of Animal Farm oh. and uh, various other things. Big animation, British animation studio back in the 50s and 60s. John Hallis then spoke to me before he died about a year later. He had a project and I did some storyboarding for him on it, which so he employed me off it. And I lied and said, oh, the, the BBC wanted to keep hold of my portfolio. And luckily I had all the negatives and bits and pieces. So I was able to amass it. Never got it back. That so that was that. Destroy- I mean, to have that crushing loss just before an interview as well, Damn. I mean, you've got to push that out. And I mind. actually put an ad in the Evening Standard saying, keep the portfolio, keep the leaves, just give me photos. Yeah. So I was able to make it back up and I got a little job out of that anyway. And I did little things. And then in 1983, looking at Screen International, um, I got in touch with a friend of mine is a close-up magician called Faye Presto. Mm-hmm. And she was just doing the sort of small pub and club circuit at the time. And I made some props for her, a little collapsible fake skull. And That's quite good because magic wasn't that big. I mean, it's, it's bigger now. It's but it bigger. Wasn't she's then. still going now. She does lots of the big tour circuits now and things like that. And she's very, very good, you know, heavy-duty yeah. close-up stuff. Fantastic. You look at it and go, and I helped make some props for certain gags. And she said, look, I've done a few jobs. And she was doing jobs for a big film parties. And said, look, I've got some contacts. So she put me in touch with Gary Kurtz. Producer of Star Wars. Wow. So I rang him. <laughs> That's a good contact to have. <laughs> to start. I rang him and he gave me an interview. Wow. And okay. he was doing, uh, he was producing Return to Oz at the time. This would have been 83. Mm-hmm. With Lyle Conway doing the head of the effects. So he took me along to meet Lyle. I spoke to him. They didn't have a job there or anything. And Dave White was there. Okay. And Steve Norrington and various other people. And he interviewed and said, well, there's nothing really going on at the moment. So I, I sort of left and went out a cup of coffee in the canteen. Looking at Screen International, noticed they were doing a film called Space Vampires um, with Toby Hooper directing. You know, Toby Hooper, you know, you think, oh. So I sort of like found out, sort of looked for Nick Maley. So I sort of like, I went to the front desk, said, oh, you know where the workshop is? And they sort of directed me. So I went and knocked on the door. And Nick was there and had a chat with him. And Bob was sitting over there. I didn't know Bob at the time. And, this is Bob um, Keane. Bob Keane. Yeah. And um, he said, look, OK. He said, look, OK, we've got some work going for sort of like a sort of starting sort of like, you know, little runner, bottom of the grave. He said, go away. Come back in two days' time with some airbrush paintings of zombies. So I went home. No money, because I'm on the dole at this point, et cetera, et cetera, just sort of getting by. And didn't have an airbrush. So I catch 50 quid off somebody to buy a little cheap airbrush, spent the next two days doing two or three airbrush paintings of zombies. Went back, they gave me a job. And I was there right till the end for about six months. And I ended up working, I ended up being Dan Parker's assistant mm-hmm. on all the makeups, watching, I think his name was Jacques Benoit, airbrushing all the zombies. And he was a brilliant French, I think he's, I think he's dead now as well, um, doing all the airbrush stuff. And there was Colin Arthur's mum, Dorothy, there doing sculpting bits and pieces. Dave White was on there. Dan Parker, um, trying to think who else? Bob Keane, uh, Jill Hopper, who's now an exec producer at DreamWorks, etc. Mm-hmm, was a very mm-hmm. good friend over there. Um, and I just got to watch everybody, and that's where I learned so much. So I was I was holding Dan's glue pot, etc., while he was sticking bits on. And it was a nice process because it was one of the, it was a mix and match zombie process where they sculpted chins, cheeks, foreheads, noses, and we would get the extras in for a whole day, and we would literally lightly stick just a say, cheeks number four with chin number two, nose number seven, etc., on the front of the face. And you'd make a mask that would fit that person, then take it off, you'd cross it across the top, take it off, and then stick the whole thing properly together. So each person had, say, six or seven masks that were made for them yeah. from generic parts. And they're all different, even though different. you've sculpted yeah. the bunch of stock exactly. things. That's a great idea. Uh, and and foam did. as well, so it would keep it shed. Yeah, exactly. you know? It didn't yeah. sort of sag. And so we had a whole room with walls and walls of masks. So every time the people come in, Dan would get there, we'll do number six. And there was some continuity for certain gags, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you can see them in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was Dorothy doing a big back creature, and then I got to. This is where I learned. To, I learned to run foam latex because I would stay late till every night running about sixty of these pieces. You know, we had to, there were six molds of each. I learned to how to duplicate molds. They're all plaster molds, mm-hmm. so I was doing clay press squash techniques to duplicate the molds. Doing six runs that says three hundred and sixty molds every night to get foams out of. So I would be the last person there, eight or nine o'clock in the evening, six yeah. days. It takes a while to run foam in plastic because you've got to slowly heat up yeah. and you slow down. And I was. Cool. This is how I learned how to run foam. Yeah. You know. And so what studio just, was this? Where would you? At Elstree. At Elstree. At Boreham, when it was big. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's a 
big fabulous big place studio, to work. very important a, studio. A lovely place to work. It was so nice, and because you could walk out and you were in the middle of a town. Yeah. So you had restaurants and cafes and banks and that all next to you. You have like a bit of life, you know. You can go and you know sort your business out in the yeah. lunch hour. And that was nice. So I learned how to do that. And I, they let me do some painting on stuff. And then they let me go on set and squirt blood on the extras. And then they let me start to stick a few pieces on. And that was my grounding. Wow. And this is where I sort of say to people today, is, you know, is you, you, as a runner, don't expect to go in just some, you know, oh, nice big silicon piece and do a full face makeup straight off. This is where you learn stuff on the job. Mm. And that was brilliant. So after that, um, I'll just... Carry on if you want me to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I mean, so, it's just, it, it, it was fascinating. Like you were saying, it is that thing of, uh, I guess there wasn't an expectation then of, of, of what you, what you could have been. I think some people might see extras on the, on a DVD and think, oh, that's the thing I want. And they're not looking at how that's achieved. And yeah. It is, it's, it's knowing the nuts and bolts thoroughly well before you sort of Well, start I think also you're looking things. at 83. It's only six years after Star Wars. You, you haven't even got Return of the Jedi out yet. Mm. Um, they were shooting. What were they? they were shooting. They was because they were shooting Return to Oz at the same time, which is a fabulous movie. Yeah, you know the claymation, the whole, the make every. I love that film. It's a beautiful film, and Steve Norrington's little chicken, you know, which is just awesome. Um, but the thing is, it's just there wasn't as much going on then. And so people didn't know about it like they do now. Yeah. And everybody wants to do it. And yes. You say I want to work in films because you think it's glamorous, and you know, you know, you know it's not. You know it's sitting around on your backside for twenty hours over a day, etc. And it's intensely boring. It can be soul destroying. It can be awful. It can be wonderful. It is, and that's just the set stuff. There's also yes. the, you know, the, the the kitchen area. You know, the where you're making stuff and, and sculpting stuff and, and endless, molding. endless days, and sometimes twenty hour days, six days a week, mm -hmm. working through the night to get something done because of bastard producer or says he wants this tomorrow instead of Thursday or whatever. and it's a nightmare mm. and then everybody else has opinions every you know every cleaner or suit that comes in has an opinion it says so you've got to change this for yeah. that then there are mistakes made and, so, and it's just and there's fabulous times to that and there's awful times to it there is but, but you've but, got to love the processes yes and 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 what's and, required of you if you don't love that part of it you're not going to get through all and that. I think as well you've got to love the final product yes and that's why I got into it, because I loved watching films. When I was a kid, I was saying earlier, but when I was a kid, yeah. I did, we didn't have video. You know, crikey, colour TV only came in 1969 when I was nine. Mm -hmm. I remember we had the first colour TV in the street because my dad worked at uh, rent or whatever it was. And so we had the first big 18-inch colour TV in the street. And we were sitting there going, oh, <laughs> you know, and that was it. So the thing is, it's just sort of like I used to watch movies when there were lots of movies on. We used to have Saturday afternoon cinema instead of football. And we didn't have all these. We had three channels mm -hmm. until 1982. It was yeah, three channel channels. Channel 4 came along. That yeah. was a big game changer. And the thing is, you know, so I used to watch films when I could. And so all those Hammer, you know, those Saturday and Friday night Hammer horror films, then the thing is I used to watch those. So you looked at, you looked at Roy Ashton's, you look at, Curse of Frankenstein, you know, great movie, gorgeous Technicolor, Pete Cushing, Christopher Lee. Mm -hmm. But you look at that makeup and you can see that half of it's wax that's peeling off on the you know, scars that have, you could put your finger under at the edges and things like that. But it's a classic. Yeah. You look at Dracula and you look at the red paint for blood spattered everywhere and things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that bright, and, bright red. You know, yeah. And you look at it and you think, wow, what was it looked like in, in, in the real world? Because now we've got all this fabulous HD of whatever grade, is the thing is that. Then it was through film, through Technicolor film. So, yeah. you know, it, it would have been looked even worse on the set. But this is what got me into it. And that's, that's why I thought I love watching movies. That's why I enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, after that, we then, you know, I got on reasonably well with Nick. He's a nice enough bloke. And Bob especially. And Dave Keane was there, etc. And we did a couple of other small projects. And then Highlander came along. Mm -hmm. And we did Highlander. Nick vacated the place halfway through Highlander. Um, suffering nervous exhaustion and just had to have Bob finish off the film. And I was sort of like Bob's sort of right-hand man at that point. And when that finished, we just sort of ensconced to Shepparton mm -hmm. and a tiny little workshop in Shepparton Studios and did a couple of bits and pieces, did some props for various little films and little TV shows and things, but nothing much. Just sort of how was, how was your experience in Highlander? Was that a fun job, do you remember? It was... As a fun time or not? Uh, no, it was, it was good fun. I mean, Russell is a fabulously creative person. 
um, his mind wanders, shall we say, um, in a nice way. Mm -hmm. But I think he just sort of like his Russell's the pro, to, to, to my pro the, the problem the problem with Highlander and most of Russell's films is it's style over content. Mm -hmm. He's more interested in getting a fabulous shot. If that shot doesn't fit in with the rest of the film, well, right. somebody else can sort that out. <laughs> And that was when Highlander 2 went completely to pot. Yes. <laughs> um, and you don't know what was done before they made the corrections to the errors. It was just, it was a nightmare. Um, Highlander was fabulous. There was a week, two weeks up in Scotland, which was interesting. Um, just sort of spending sort of two weeks on a battlefield with lots of blood and guts and lots of very big, angry, often drunk, sort of like Scottish people. Um, <laughs> but it was interesting. It was good fun. Yeah. It was good fun. Um, but unfortunately, sort of like Nick, sort of like lost that, lost out on that. So we finished that off and did a few bits and pieces, and it was it was good fun. And it's a fabulous movie. It's mm -hmm. dated a little bit, but there's some lovely, some stylish. It's very very stylish. So all those lovely scene changes, you know, cutting through from the car park to the lock and things. Yeah, yeah. It's a very very stylish film. Unfortunately, the the acting is not wonderful in some. Of no, the but moments. it was quite unique at the time as well. I mean, it wasn't anything real like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I didn't know how to take it when I first yeah. saw it. I was quite young when I saw it, but it is. But that's its strength. Is the thing is, it, it doesn't feel like it has to explain itself. Yeah. And then, of course, unfortunately, they went on to do Highlander Two, <laughs> which we're also involved in, that tried to explain and why you'd have something called the cloud on a planet at the other end of the galaxy is my yeah. I just mind-bogglingly ridiculous, and it was awful. It was it was a nightmare. Apparently, Connery <coughs> refused to sign the contract until he'd rewritten half the script, and yet it was still the biggest pile of poo you've ever seen in your life. And then they ran out of money, and they couldn't make certain scenes join up. So if you really watch that film, you'll see something happening, and then all of a sudden it's 2,000 miles away. Wow. And it just makes no sense. Did you see this editor somewhere tearing their hair out trying to go, how am I going to make this work? It's awful. It's awful. <laughs> But still, finally we finished, and then this man called Alan Jones turned up. Do you know Alan? Yeah. Um, you'd know him if you sort of... Have you ever been to Fright Fest? He organises A long Fright, time ago. He organises yeah, Fright yeah. Fest. Tall guy, balding, okay. like us, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he used to do things like writing the backs of video covers okay. and writing for Fango, Gorzo, all these kind of things. And he just turned up one day and sort of said, oh, yeah. And we'd known him because um, he, was, he was the publicity. He was doing publicity on Highlander. And he said, oh, I've got this friend who sort of like has got a budget to make a low-budget horror film. Would you be interested? And he sort of took us to meet Clive. And that was it, you know. This so, being Clive Barker. Barker. <laughs> <laughs> so we all went down to Crouch End, to Clive's house in Crouch End, and he outlined Hellraiser for us and said, it's a low-budget film. They're paying me a pittance, which was a serious pittance in those days, what they paid him. And said, this is the budget we've got. Would you be interested? And we said, yeah, because it just sounded so fascinating. I'd never heard of the man. So I went and read the books of Blood and Damnation Game. That was the only, I think, novel he got out at the time. I thought, mm -hmm. this is fabulous stuff. So we just took that on. And then that made a little bit of history, you know. So And that was fabulous. You know, I still look back as Hellraiser was, excuse me, um, the most enjoyable sort of time of my life sort of in films. Because the thing is that we're all reasonably young. This was 85, so I was 25. Um, and I know Bob got a bit of reputation for employing perhaps far too many young people as sort of like a sort of bunch of kids who Had weren't you set up in Image Animation? By oh, now. yes, sure. We'd set up, Image Animation was born sort of when we moved off Highlander and we just called it that and that was it. And it was about a year later we then got stuck into Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. But we, we opened up a bigger, we moved to a bigger workshop in Shepparton uh, that Dan Parker then took over for Animated Extras. Yes, uh, I know, Building 19, I think, because yes, yeah. uh, that, that and, room's um, got some uh, history in yes, it. Yes, yeah. And it was it was just good fun, and then we got um, Nigel Booth joined us at the end of Highlanders, so he came in for Hellraiser, mm -hmm. and David Elsie, mm -hmm. um, he started there as well, mm -hmm. and Little John uh, and Simon Sace, John you know all these people, yeah, yeah, all these yeah. people, and it's just we just had the time of our life because although it wasn't a mega budget, we were all paid reasonably well and we had a laugh and it was just working on something that you knew was creative because you know it's Clive yeah. and you the didn't know like you never do when you no, work on something you don't know what you're making you don't know how it's going to go down I got the lead Cenobite so fine okay you know and Clive I saw one drawing there's so many drawings more popped up now that I honestly never saw these drawings there was one drawing that was a very tribal thing with spikes coming out of his head and I, ch I changed it to nails or pins at the time, so to speak, um, and then designed the makeup and made it geometric. And then I also designed the first, the second stage of Skin Frank. The first stage was David Elsie. Mm -hmm. The second stage was me, was the first makeup. And then Cliff Wallace did the third stage um, with makeup built, built on top of my makeup. So we could just add pieces to it so it was, it was all doable. And we just had a great fun time. The money seemed to sort of just keep coming. So there was, there was a reasonable budget for it, for what it was. 
And then we moved up to Cricklewood and shot the whole film in Production Village there mm -hmm. and in the house just around the corner. And we had a great time because all the Cenobites were played by Doug, Nick and Grace for the, for the first film. And Simon Bamford, who all knew Clive from his old production days of the theatre company days, the dog, whatever, the, I can't remember the name of the company. And Doug was one of Clive's oldest friends. And so we got on with them. We enjoyed ourselves, you know, and it was a good laugh. And we just worked, we were young, we worked ourselves to the bone like you do, but had a laugh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at the same time thinking, this is really weird. You know, you've got dildos on posts and all this kind of stuff and just weird, <laughs> weird, weird things. <laughs> and Clive said, no, go to town on it. You know, vaginal openings in throats, make it sexual and make it like these things are, you sort of think, well, I don't know. Do I want to know? Oh, what? Yeah. Oh, is that, that? Oh. And it, I just love the idea of, uh, you know, them saying, like, make it sexual. You're like, oh, you want it to be saucy. Mm. No, no, I actually want vaginas and throats. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that was the whole thing. John, uh, yeah, because John sculpted it on the first. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, buttable. I mean, when he's sitting there, he's got this slit that he's sitting there, you know, playing with. It was always, uh, Clive, you know, you read Clive's stuff, it's always very sexual. Yeah, it always ends up with, with, with lots of shagging and blood yeah, and, uh, yeah. and the big monster. So he said, go for it. He said, I want these. I mean, you know, the, there was always the, the original title, Hellraiser, a love story. <laughs> and then you go back to s and Demons from Beyond the Grave, which is what he wanted to call it originally, but it was just too corny and just too silly, and it wouldn't have worked. But the idea was to call it Hellraiser, colon, a love story. Wow. Because it is a love story. It's the story of a woman who, you know, will kill for the best fuck she's ever had, basically. And, you know, and it's, this, this was the love of her life, who turns up as a, as a sort of a, a skin corpse and says, if you kill men, it'll grow, my, it'll grow me back again. And she wants that sex again. She wants that love again. And that's exactly what it is. It's a classic Hollywood love story, which is why I always, I mean, I will always, I, I saw it again a couple of years ago at a, at a showing of the first two. And it's got, you know, it's a low-budget film, that awful dubbing that New World did afterwards to sort of relocate it to the States, even though it's blatantly England. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, there are certain genius touches, you know, the bit when they've, they've had their first sex, he's still skinned, and they're him smoking a cigarette. Yeah. And the audience, every time, laughs. And it's this nervous laughter of, hang on, post-coital cigarette, uh, but no skin. Oh, God, she's just, oh. Yeah. And she's that <laughs> desperate to have sex that she'll have sex with him without a skin. And it's, but you believe it because it's Claire Higgins and all, the, and he just got these good actors, and it's just, it was just wonderful. But nobody knew what we were doing at the time. We were sitting in a garage at the back of Cricklewood Production Village. Do you know Production Village? No, no. It's um, it's a small lake with two bars either side and a small shooting studio. That it's not a sound stage. So there's the, the classic stories. Is the thing is that they had a, a third assistant director who would wander out and stand by the pond because the ducks wouldn't quack when there was somebody standing there. And you could hear, like we did just now, you could hear ducks quacking in the background, so you'd have to go and stand outside. Uh, one day, he actually had to go out of the studio, walk all the way around the block, to knock on the door of a people who were having a row in the house, the other side of the studio wall, to sort of like say... Could you keep it down, please? <laughs> so, you know, sound trying stuff, to make a classic horror movie. It was, yeah. <laughs> Um, but we just sat there in this tiny little garage with the sort of like Nigel Booth doing... Uh, Nigel Booth did Chatterer. That's it. And then little John did female sound. I did Doug. And Cliff Wallace did Butterball. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting there. And then there's Paul Catling there doing um, Skin Corpse and Bits and, and the Engineer, the big creature. Yep. Um, and we were crammed into this place. And every now and then you'd hear this beep, beep, beep of a lorry reversing back delivering beer. And <laughs> it was a bar weird. or two? Uh... There's two bars in Production Village. <laughs> right. It is essentially an entertainment complex okay. where they had bands on in, the, in what was we were shooting for the sound stage. I thought you were going to say that Clive has a big drink thing and he just wanted <laughs> beer delivered on set. <laughs> um, and it was weird. And then we shot in that house around the corner that was fabulous. And we would just sit there and we were having a laugh. And, you know, we all smoked in those days, etc. And Doug smoked. So I would have, you know, I'd have Doug's cigar holder with his little fag in because he couldn't smoke because he had prosthetics on, etc., etc. Sort of like standing there waiting for him. And we just set up this relationship that worked. Wow. And we just had a brilliant, brilliant time. We worked loads of hours and just didn't know anything about it. And then it must have been towards the end of it when they'd started to cut it together that New World came back and said, we quite like what you're doing here. <laughs> And they Please gave us, <laughs> well, they, they said, we want to enlarge upon it. There's, there's certain bits that um, originally you never saw Frank being reformed from the floorboards. Yeah. You'd simply just sort of see the blood dripping on. And then all of a sudden you'd cut to the sort of like the skin corpse grabbing him. So they said, we're going to give you some more money. And that's where the engineer came from, from the end. 
not wonderful, but it worked to a certain degree, and they wanted a monster. And we had the whole Bertha Frank sequence that David Elsie then designed that stage one thing for, yeah. with all the sort of melting, the reverse melting techniques. As you say, all practically, you know, yeah, all yeah. practically, all old school, you know, sort of like wax heart <coughs> you melt and reversed it, and loads of reverse shots for all the blood coming out the floorboards and things. Mm. Um, and did all that, and then did a little extra rat sequence. We had to, do you know the story about the rat? No, yeah, tell me about it. We had rats. problems with the BBFC, as they were at the time, with the, with the censorship and with the blood and guts. And so there was this old idea that if you actually went in, with um, Clive sort of said if we make it really hyper gory then the thing is that when they cut it we get a lot more of the gore left in because they'll think they've taken all the heavy duty stuff out and we still get some nice stuff in so for instance when Prudhoe the first victim gets killed he deliberately shot it and it was not nice to watch because when she whacks him with that hammer in the original cut you see five blows to the head and by the last one he's crying and it's really quite upsetting and they cut it down to two blows for the original the BBFC took about three because it's and that was always sort of intended Mm -hmm. but there's the classic story of when you see the rat nailed to the wall because Frank nails the rats to the wall to keep them quiet to stop the others coming up to discover him up there and there's a shot of a wiggling rat on the wall nailed to the wall and Bob had to take the animatronic rat down to the BBFC to show to prove them that, that it that was not a real rat. rat. It's, he did take it down there. I know that part's yeah. true, but whether that was just a publicity thing as well, we'll never know. Oh my gosh. But you know, and so they they gave us this extra money, and then what about when did Horizon come out? Eighty five, eighty six, whatever it was. Or that was it. It was it was totally just sort of like it was this big success. Yeah. All of a sudden, we had the front covers of Time Out and all this. We had displays in Forbidden Planet Bookshop, and we were just doing makeups and signings and all this kind of thing. And very very iconic image, you know, the whole yeah. pinhead thing. Was... And all of a sudden, this makeup that I'd just been given the lead lead Cenobite, and even as Doug said, I remember Doug going on the set the first day. The first the first line he ever has, um, the first line he shot in the film was um, where. Kirsty comes up to the lot and sees um, the skinned Frank, but it's actually her, it's, I can't remember, it's her father, and she thinks it's her father, but it's not, it's actually Frank. Mm-hmm. And Pinhead points down and goes, we want the man who did this. And Doug hated that because he, go, he, he looks back and says, we want the man who did this. You know, and it sort of becomes too different. It almost becomes comedy. And he said, I wanted to redo it again. And that was the first thing he ever shot. But the thing is, it's just sort of like, it's just, we had all those things there. It's just, it became silly. And, he, we had about eight lines in the film, and he just thought, "Let's just like, walk away and do that." And because you know, he then did ten films after that, yeah, yeah. and it just became all of a sudden. It was yeah, he was getting rung up for interviews, and, oh, and I was getting rung up for interviews, and I was doing stuff on Radio Four and kids TV shows and things like that. And it's just silly. <laughs> and then they go and do Hellraiser Two. Suck it up, man! It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, we did a couple other films. We did Waxworks, I think, between it. Mm-hmm. And then we did, we moved to Pinewood to do Hellraiser 2. We did a couple of other small bits and pieces. And then did Hellraiser 2. And in the meantime, Bob was then working in California doing a few other things. So I took over the running and did run Hellraiser 2. Wow. Um, which we did at Pinewood with a, a reasonably expanded budget. Um, and Tony Randall directing, who I still speak to Tony a lot these days. Um, and just had a reasonably good fun time. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, sort of like it was. It was one of those odd things that you know. I think Rick Baker always said is the thing is that no matter how much money they give you, you will always run out of money. The the the, the, the effects you will always be creative, and the effects will then you expand. Get, get you grow to fill your boots, don't and you? Then you want more afterwards to make yeah, it yeah. better. So we did some big things, and there were some big sets, and we hoisted Ken Cranham <laughs> on a head loft and ripped his neck, and God knows oh what else, etc. Um, <laughs> and it's not the greatest film but it's I swear it's, it's, it's watching it again I'm thinking ooh, ooh, you know a little bit, and it's just a bit corny in places but there are people who revere that film these days who think it's better than the first one which but there is, were some lovelies not. I mean that Kenneth Cranham bit with the wires across the, the face the wires yeah I mean that's just and, you know, really well nice. you've seen the, the Memories of Image page on Facebook mm-hmm, and things mm-hmm. that's a great, that's yeah, it's a great and they're actually page. doing that I've just actually sent off all that footage um, that I took on the video camera of all the makeup room footage from Hellraiser 2 I've just sent off to some people in the States because they're, um, the production company is doing a Blu-ray of Hellraiser 2 and they want to put a lot of that footage onto the making of, uh, which comes out, I think, at the end of this year or something or whatever. And isn't that nice? I mean, there weren't people desperately keen to have everyone sign non-disclosure agreements and keep all this stuff away, yes. you know? Because the thing well, is, a lot of that it. stuff they don't do anything with, even even if they, exactly. they prevent you. you know? So you know, I, I I just wandered around with the video camera, and I could do it at three o'clock in the morning. So he got dug in his little leotard with his cigar in the holder, and his glasses being propped up on his nails, sticking out of his face, doing a little dance, you know, with his red nose on for red nose day, you know. And it's just silly stuff and awful quality because it was you know just video cassette in those days. Yeah. 
Um, and it was good fun. You know, it was some long days. There were some certain problems with certain members of the crew. I, I had to sack my first people and things like that, you know, but you just do oh, it. man, heavy is the head of he who wears the crown. But I, I enjoyed it. And, and I, 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 you know, I, Rick Baker got out of the business because of the sort of the business part of it, because as he said, he sat in an office all day and didn't get to sculpt. Yeah. And I found out, certainly on Nightbreed later, but on Hellraiser 2 as well, it's the thing is that I was often... Um, just sort of sitting in an office, signing checks and making decisions and doing this, and then say I was seeing that, that oh, then so-and-so wants a meeting with that. And then when everybody had gone home at the end of the day, I would spend a couple of hours doing some sculpting. Yeah. You know, because... I know things. people who do that now, I know like Niels does that and Barry Gower as well. It's like, yeah. you know, they've got to run the business and then when the phone stop ringing, it's like yeah. they'll, they'll stay for a few hours. And I love the delegation like part and I love sitting down with a group of people and the designing part and stuff. But at the same time, you do want to sit down sometimes and just sculpt or paint something. Yeah. And that's the horrible part of it. And so I know exactly where they are all coming from totally. Sure. So as long as you got s- certain things. So I took on two major makeups. Wow. How um, big was your crew at this time? How many people would you um, say you had working for you on the second Hellraiser? I'd say about 15. Okay. About that's 15, quite a big crew. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I'd say 10 to 15 at, 15 at tops when we really got going because we sort of had all the corpses to make for the corpse scenes. We had, you know, lots of interesting things. And it, it wasn't like an established thing. As, I mean, you had like Henson's and maybe that's, that's it. Really. SFX UK ran sort of like makeup crews when they did more makeup y type things. Yeah. Um, but they were more of a physical effects, you know, port, the core bolts, et cetera, sure. and things like that. We were still trying to figure things yeah. out. It wasn't, yeah. you know. So, you know, it, it's we got this big workshop at Pinewood that became our bigger workshop when we expanded for Nightbreed. Um, and we just we just carried on from there. So I then sort of like sculpted the channel makeup. I thought, I know to make it easier, I'll do it as a full overhead mask. Okay, which was the silliest thing I ever did in my life. <laughs> um, Why so? Is well, it, because it became too you know, unwieldy. No, and... because the thing is, okay, I know we went back to masks a little bit with the with silicon, but we've now almost gone back a little bit to pieces because yeah. they are easier to apply. Yeah. Because if you have a full overhead mask, getting the brush inside certain places to it's make tricky. it stick is a nightmare. Yeah. Now with silicon, they went onto that thing where I think Neil was doing Neil was doing where you'd put sort of AB silicon mix over the head, yeah. put the mask on, you'd have ten minutes to squidge it around and then do the edges with your telesis or whatever. But the thing is with foam, you're stuck with either your prosade or your telesis or what we had, you know, corning, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And if you get it wrong, it's a nightmare. Yeah. So I would put the mask on and you had the wires of course. So we had the wire. We designed it with these wires sort of coming down, pulling into we got the elastic wires, which we got loads of all these tests of pulling them onto people's faces, and they would ping and do all the wrong things. And we got it to work, and it was all working quite. We had a, we had a little rig that somebody was pulling the wires tight. They weren't elastic; they were real wires. And as it went back, somebody was pulling each individual pair of wires. So as it went around Ken's face, they all stayed tight, and it worked beautifully. Um, but you then had the wires on the makeup, and I thought, well, if I do a circle of wire. If Ken loses a bit of it's not quite in the right place where the makeup is or whatever, it's going to be loose. Mm. So I thought they've got to be a separate end. So I basically did a full overhead mask with a slot at the back and then had a separate piece that stuck over the top. So the thing is you put the mask on, then get it all glued down, paint it up, put the wires on, little tacks of super glue just to make sure they're nice and tight, and then put this last piece on over the back that made it look like the wires were digging into the back of his brain. And you never really much saw the back of his head anyway, so it didn't really matter. Um, and it worked to a certain degree. It's just that horrible thing, you know, when you've got eye holes and mouth, and you're having to, mm-hmm. and to get the glue, and you, you, you got the process. It worked. It yeah, stayed yeah. on, but I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> but Ken was a joy to work with. I'd known him as an actor, watching him on TV sometimes, and it was fabulous. Um, and so we thought, fine. And I started at the beginning of the schedule. David Barron was our production manager. I mean, he's gone on to big, big, big things. Um, as a production manager, coordinator, producer, whatever. And I said to him, so I said, do, do Channard and Pinhead ever shoot on the same day? And he said, there's only one scene where they actually get together, where he sort of like, it comes through and Channard turns Pinhead back into the army officer. And he said, we've got one day for that. I said, OK. So I thought, I'll do it. I can do two makeups in one day just for one day, no problem at all. Easy. In the interest of saving budget or just the hubris of being well, able to do it? Well, I'd sculpted it and I sort of thought, no, you know, I was young, stupid, whatever. I don't know. I thought I can do it one day. It became two days. It became a, I said, but it's Monday and Thursday, so I've got time to recover between. Okay. I said, all I can do is I can have a separate assistant on each one. I have Roy for Pinhead and Steve Painter for Channard. And I said, can you give me one promise? Can you stagger them? 
So I do one first and then I have a little break and then do the other one afterwards and my assistants can then finish off bits and I can bit pop in the same makeup room. So I said, yeah, no problem. So we get to the Monday. Doug's in at three o'clock in the morning, 3.30 start the makeup. About sort of three hours worth of makeup, sort of 6.30. Ken rolls in about six o'clock. And then I'm finishing Doug off saying, all right, okay, you do that. So then I move over. Steve's then helping me. He's perfectly good at doing what he's doing at that point. It's one of his first jobs. So helping me stick the makeup on. So I'm sticking that on, etc. Just, oh, yeah, no, don't do that. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. oh yeah. And just watching Doug's then finish. Quick checks. Yeah, okay, you can go. Then somebody else goes out to set with him. Roy, possibly, but one of the other makeup artists goes out. Little John will look after him. I finish off Ken. So overall, I'm looking at an eight-hour makeup for two two people, mm -hmm. both falling asleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We get to the end of the day; they haven't done the shot. I will do it tomorrow. I'm thinking, <laughs> great. That's, uh, that's not an unusual thing for me to hear. <laughs> so Thursday's pieces become Tuesday's pieces. Yeah. So I get home. I get both makeups taken off. Them not having shot. Um, I get home about eleven o'clock. And we say, okay, tomorrow I'll do the two makeups. We do them the other way around, because I thought it didn't really matter which one was on first. Sure. So we do them the other way around, and we get through the end of the day. They go on with Steve and somebody else onto the set, waiting to be shot. I run back into workshop, pre-paint another set, or I think there's one set pre-painted for another day future, and nail that up ready for the next day, or for Thursday, which is still coming, mm -hmm. with my day off in the middle. They get to the end of the day, and guess what? They didn't shoot it. We'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> what are they shooting at this point where they can God afford to, to push two actors like that to one side? Oh, you know, no, they're on particularly <laughs> big as such. End of Tuesday, Ken is saying, please, can we shoot? Because he said, oh, I'm so into this character. You know, I don't know this, you know. But. So we do, do Wednesday. And so I do the same thing on Wednesday. And then, of course, we shoot Thursday as planned. So I do two, three hour, three and a half hour makeups. Enlarged, so eight hours of makeup application essentially mm -hmm. from really about 3.30 in the morning to about 11.30 in the morning, four days in a row. And I'm just knackered. Yep. And they said, they said, we're on set. I finally went on the set on Thursday afternoon because there was nothing else to do, thankfully. And I'm sitting there and I looked at my hand and I went, oh, I, was like, oh, I can't stop I my hand shaking. Are, yeah, shakes, yeah. And so John said, look, little John said, and Ken Cram said, yeah, they said, look, you're, you're knackered. Look, there's a piece of foam, like the foam rule, sort of like something, whatever, in the costume. Go have a nap for a couple of hours. We'll, we'll, if there's any problems, we'll get you, but just go have a nap. The next thing I know, I'm being kicked. And it's Ken Cranham, out of makeup, it's midnight. And he's saying, We're all going home now, Jeff, are you done? And I've fallen asleep, just gone to sleep for eight hours solid. <laughs> and he'd used me as a footrest while they were taking the makeup off. <laughs> you had no and idea. And that was it, I had no <laughs> idea. So. Did you get credit for that? No. <laughs> it was just, it was interesting. You know, I wouldn't, I was too, you know, young, naive, well, I don't know, I wouldn't do it again. But oh the thing is, it's just there weren't, that, there weren't as many people around then. But, you know, and the film came out and it did reasonably well. And, it, you know, they went on to another, what was it, nine sequels, I think, that yeah, just disappeared like that. in that awful Hellraiser 11. But by that point, of course, I'd left Image. So we carried on from there, what, that was 80, 87, 88. And then we did Nightbreed. Nightbreed. Now, Nightbreed I want to talk about because Nightbreed was probably the movie that switched me on more. Like, that, like, Fangoria was going crazy for it. And it was one of the... There, well, there weren't that many movies with a lot of creatures, mm. in, certainly in England. Um, although you, it, it was, you know, shot in England. I mean, it, it, it didn't feel like an, an English movie. No, but, no. But, but because of it happening at Image, you know, I was aware of all that kind of stuff. Um and that, yeah, there was a lot of stuff on that. And, and the people you get in, that image, I mean, I think a lot of people have to appreciate the, the you know, the alumni of, uh, alumni of, of, of people that came through image. Mm. It's like a who's who of, of, of yeah. British makeup effects. Yeah. I mean, if we just go through <laughs> some of them, like Neil Gorton. Neil Gorton. Did he start on Nightbreed, do you think, for you? Yes. He wasn't on the Hellraiser 2. I'll have to no. ask him. But, uh, he was, yeah. I mean, no, he wasn't. You know. No, he wasn't on Hellraiser 2. He did Nightbreed, then he did Lair of the White Worm with us. That was it. And then, yeah, I'm pretty sure he started on Nightbreed. And then Mark Coulier uh, as Mark well. Coulier. <laughs> Mark Coulier had started before. Mark Coulier was on Hellraiser 2 mm -hmm. and had started on the original Waxworks. Um, and then Paul Jones, who's now working in Canada. Uh, we had Tom Loughton, oh, who yeah, was his Tom. first English job. Yep. I think he came over and did um, uh, did the little creature there. Um, the I can't remember the name of it, but the one that the little girl that turns into the creature. Mm -hmm. um, 
Sean Harrison. Yeah, so Sean Harrison. Stuart Conran. Stuart Conran, yeah. Um, Chris uh, Hall. Chris Hall. <laughs> or Cunningham. Yeah, or Chris Cunningham, yeah. Stuart Conran, I mean, this is the weird thing, you see. I know all these people when they were sort of like, you know, virtually school kids. I mean, Chris Halls, you know, was, I mean, you know, who just looks... When you see him these days, he doesn't make much of appearances these days, does he? But um, the thing is, he's sort of like grungy still. I mean, he was this sort of like 15, 16-year-old young man in his very smart little tweed blazer with his parents sitting in the car waiting outside to take him home. Yeah. Um, you know, and he was just, he was a genius then. So you could, you know, uh, Chris Fitzgerald. Yep. Do you know Chris? Yeah. And he started there. He brought in these beautiful um, dioramas that we just said, oh, my God, these are gorgeous. Um, who else? I'm trying to think. To Mark Crane, I think you mentioned that. But you know, and and, and what, what's good is that you know, some of these people have gone on to do amazing mm. things. I mean, Mark Coulier's Oscar, yeah, double Oscar, yeah, yeah. Neil Gordon, Neil, doing Neil Gordon, exactly. you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's spectacular. And uh, Chris Cunningham now, yeah. you know, mainly directing. known for doing directing Bjork videos and, and Madonna, Square Pusher and Madonna yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. Aphex Twin videos yeah. and. You know. yeah. I mean, so <laughs> so you, just, you had a good eye, obviously, for staff, because you got well, some good people in, you no, know. They were cheap. <laughs> um, which is true to a certain degree. It's the thing is that Nightbreed, for all its... We, I think we had pushing about a million pounds for the effects budget, which was enormous. Yeah. But when you look at what we had to do and what we did, it wasn't. So the thing is that, I mean, I, you know, whether we were right or wrong, I think we had sometimes a reputation for taking a load of school kids on set who would trip over things, etc., etc. But then again, I think the film industry has a certain reputation for having boring old smart asses who've been there years, etc., etc., who think they know everybody's job backwards and all that kind of thing. So there was a bit of both sides. But we had this young, fresh, creative input. And we didn't employ them because they were cheap. I think we, as far as I remember, we paid everybody a reasonable wage, at least certainly the going rate. Mm-hmm. And we had a lot of fun. Well, it was, it was obviously a rate enough for them to take the job yeah, otherwise they yeah, have done it, it. That they lived off it etc etc I'm sure a lot of people would have complained and all that kind of thing you know yeah. and David Elsie was David Elsie on Nightbreed no he wasn't David Elsie was on Hellraiser t- uh, Hellraiser and I think he did Hellraiser I can't remember Hellraiser 2 or not um, but the thing is you know it's, it's just we started off all these people and the thing is that I'm not saying they wouldn't have got a job elsewhere but as you said before, it was us and Henson's mostly. Nick Dudman was sort of like, you know, but he hadn't got sort of the, the big organisation set up at the point of certainly Hellraiser 2. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just, we just sort of said, look, you know, if you think you can do this, we'll guide you through it, etc. We'll, we'll organise, we'll run it, we'll pay you, we'll get the material sorted. And these people were doing it. And by this point, the industry had taken off that little bit more, that people coming to us with a little bit more knowledge though and certainly when I'd started, I went back in the sort of seventies and stuff, than than most people had. Mm. So they were slightly more au fait with sort of foam latex or principles and processes because of things like, you know, remember the you remember the tech log in Gorzo? Mm-hmm. Oh God, um, you like know, that. the Caglione and Drexler did. Oh, I've got, I've got a lot of those. Oh, I've got them all. I've got They're from amazing. I've got Fangor and Gorzone from number one onwards, still with all the posters in You shouldn't have told me that. I'm not They're <laughs> worth a small fortune. They are not here. They're I think they should do... Lot I, I wanted a campaign, um, uh, Starlog, to try and reprint just the Caglione and Drexler got, labs as, yeah, as a book yeah. because they would make such a, an, an exactly. interesting article. Well, I still use them. There was a, a fabulous thing. You know, when you, Chris DeCal is not that much used these days. Yeah. But we still use it at, at London College of Fashion because it's a good basic and it's cheap. And when you've got students who haven't got a lot of money, the principles, I, when I teach now, and we'll perhaps talk about it, I teach on principles mm-hmm. that you know that a mould made from Chris DeCal or, or resin or fiberglass or whatever, the principles are still the same. Yes. The keys, the, whether it's bolted, whatever. And the, the cutting edges, all those things, they still stand today. The yeah. same principles I learned nearly 30-odd years ago, they still stand. Yeah. So if you can make a mould out of crystal, as long as you then learn the ins and outs, the technical difficulties, the dangers of some of the other materials, then you should be okay. Hmm. So the point is, is that sort of like Cagliari and Drexler did a lovely thing. And you know Christical will sort of get, I, I took my, my... Versatility, thy name be plaster. Yes. Yes, I remember that, that very feature. And the feature. thing is, it's just the thing is, it will, you mix it to a certain way, and then it gets thicker, and you do something with it, it gets a bit thicker, it gets cream cheesy, as I always say, and then you build it, and then it gets, and so on That's and so That's right, forth. and they build this tower, a don't tower. they? A tower. And you remember dollops. it well. Yeah. yeah. And I said to them, look... With a clock, know, so you could see exactly. the duration. And I will do it for them sometimes. So look, this is how it works. If you know how your material works and how long it's going to take... Yeah. If you mix it, I say with cold water, some people say hot, but I say cold because then you know it's always going to be the same every time. Yeah. So the thing is, you say, look, put a blob there, walk away, do this. Now, if I shake the table, it will go blah. 
But if you leave it, it will set by itself a little bit, even while the stuff in the bowl is still liquid. So I put the blob on top. And I will build them that sort of 8-inch tall tower out of the same batch of plaster. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you know how it works, this is how it does. Mm -hmm. And all that stuff was in that tech thing in, in Caglione and Drexler, yeah. in, in Gorzone. And they were brilliant because nobody else was doing that. Yeah, no one was breaking that down. I love that about them. Exactly. It was fantastic. And it's, it's my big gripe of some of the, the makeup magazines that you get these days. Thankfully, Neil has now done his thing, which is technical stuff. Yeah, that when he makes, drills down to exactly, you know, the but nuts that's and a technical magazine. Things in there, but I want to know far more detail, far more pictures than they've got. Yeah, and yes, the digital wank magazines do it, and Neil's magazine. That's it, and this is what we want, yeah. and the makeup shows and all that. So you've got now with all these courses and things, you've got all this stuff there to hand. Yeah, but we just sort of like you know, it's just mainly learned it ourselves from magazines. So the thing is that we, you know we were still using plaster moulds in those days and a bit of fiberglass for the big pieces, mm -hmm. but it was mainly Christical. Yeah, and you know the ins and outs of Christical. You run a foam latex mould in Christical ten runs, yeah, and it's really starting and breaking, to break down. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is that you know I'm teaching people how to duplicate with clay squeezes, or we're taking silicons off and doing duplications from that, and and it's not the easiest thing in the world. So with Nightbreed, with those creatures, we. I, d I think at a count there are about 200 individual creatures in that film. Wow. So like a, a, a condensed, you know, all the things you'd need to know, mm. like, you know, making mobs last, being able to reproduce them, being able to store yeah. loads of pre-made pieces yes, and yeah. applications yeah. and overlapping yeah. creatures. Making... All that happened in one movie. I mean, yes. it's a real good and we, training ground. And we that. were doing basics. We were throwing stuff. I mean, the thing is that I did, I did Baffa, the, the Baffa May makeup. Mm -hmm. Um, because I was running so much, because you can't. So I did this nice makeup, which I was quite pleased with, on this um, this big six foot tall black guy, dark blue makeup. I don't know, don't you know, I copied the paint job off the original Batmobile. Oh wow! They were shooting the original <laughs> Tim Burton the Batman. Yeah. And the Batmobile was parked next door, so I popped down there. They were building Gotham City on the back lot at Pinewood. I'd pop down to the, the garage because it's still one of my favourite ones from the very first one because it's got that fifties feel. And I looked at the paint job and said, this is really nice. What have you done? And I said, well, it's black with about five different coats of interference colours over the top. So I did the same paint job on Buffer, mate. It's, it's a black paint job with then airbrush coats of interference colours. So the lights kick off and kick off different colours as, okay. as they bounce off him. They then covered it in this appallingly blotchy optical that you virtually can't see the thing. Steve Painter is then doing this full life-size one with a head that's about three foot high. He's sculpting that in the corner there. So we're working off each other. Um, and it was it was nice, but we were running a major foam lab there, so there were about three people running foam all day. Mm -hmm. We had a major mould room with about three people running mould rooms there. Um, there was just tons and tons and tons of stuff going on. And on top of that, we just sort of said, look, you've got five minutes. I had a couple of days where I thought, okay. So I, I sculpted a, a, a head, a weird sort of looking head that was just silly. And I thought, well, it's, it's, we've got to get somebody in there. I don't just want somebody walking around like an old Star Trek alien. So I basically just made a big body stocking in you know, little spare moments. And then I cut loads of bits of foam up, just old bits of foam, and did a spine down the back, put somebody into it, made them into like a slug with a spine that went down from this thing, and then just made it up. It's, it was like latex and evil stick. If you mix it together, it sets itself. Mm -hmm. And you hit a hairdryer onto the evil stick, and it cobwebs yeah it turns yeah so i did like a rotten three. flesh slug with a spine going down the back and you see it in the film pulling himself along on his arms just at one shot and then we would salvage everything we can we'd sort of like go skip hunting and find old bits of this and bits of that or whatever um you know and just, just to try and meet the demand of the yeah. sheer number of creatures because well, it's supposed to be midian this whole this is where all the creatures in the world end up yeah. being isn't it so and you, this you is where the problem sparsely populated <laughs> well you see the thing is that the way I always look upon it, the problem with Nightbreed was there was this triangle. You had Clive Barker. Now, Clive is a genius. No problem with that. Um, he's still doing pretty well, etc., etc. You know, I've been to see him a couple of times in the States, and he was a very, very good friend. Unfortunately, his creativity is unlimited. He's the only person I can see. You, you'll be sitting there talking about a certain project, and you'll be sitting there doing a little illustrated signing on one book, thinking about the next book with this with this hand or with this half of his brain, and talking about. He can do. He's just a genius. He's just. He's watching him draw. It's just, this just fountain of inspiration constantly. Total. But then there's no rails at which to exactly. guide either. So, so you, you know, in a film, the rails, the guides, are provided by the producer, yes. who says you can't afford to do that, Clive. Yeah. Unfortunately, the producer, and it's a sort of reasonably well-known story, Christopher Figg, did not guide him. And we were about halfway through the movie, and Clive's 
mot du jour, shall we say, was basically, oh, we'll do it in post. Oh, we'll do it in post. We'll fix it in post. And this is pre-CG, so <laughs> that's quite an so undertaking to optically The thing repair. is, and he would come into the workshop, where so everyone said, I've had this great idea. I had this great idea. I mean, Boone and Baphomet were virtually on the... But Boone, the main character, Little John's makeup, was virtually the design. He couldn't lock down the design, and we were about three weeks from shooting it. I've got to make this. And John had to get... <laughs> I, know, I know that's three weeks is a reasonably long time these days, but the thing is, it's, it was just, you know, we were getting yeah. it worried. So, so, so as soon as the words, I've got a great idea, come up, you know that that spells trouble. <laughs> and he would come in with a quick drawing and things like that, and, he, yeah, yeah. you know, he would sketch something out and say, oh. So we were just having... We were... God, we had one woman, we had a person rolling glue and we threw loads of polystyrene beads at them, spray painted it, gone on set. We had, <laughs> we'd, we'd have loads and loads, we'd have an old bit, there's a character with fingers coming out of their chins. Lizzie B, I remember that one in the book. You know, loads of stuff. And there was Kate Murray, did the, uh, the elephant head people with the eyes coming. There was so much stuff. Yeah. Martin Mercer took the Vasty Moses makeup that John had done, you know, the big baldy thing with the little arms, etc., etc. Yeah, et yeah, yeah. Refigured that into the man that's on the stilts with his legs broken backwards. Yep. Yeah. That's the same piece. It was just nightmarish. And it got out of control. And they were running out of money. So, new, uh, not New World. Morgan Creek came in and basically sacked Christopher Fig and brought in uh, Mar- Gabrielli, Martina Gabrielli, this really hotshot American producer. Da da da, shuffle here, etc., etc. Brought John Barron in again to sort of sort out the production schedule and um, got it online. And then gave them a load more money to go and do those awful reshoots that okay. they shot in the States with some perfectly nice makeup effects by other people, but by this time Greg Cronenberg's hair had grown. And if you look carefully, you'll see his hair change. That two inches <laughs> difference. Um, and that's when they then screwed the movie big time because they looked at it. Morgan Creek are the people who, do, do you know The Exodus 3? I mean, a brilliant, brilliant film. But Morgan Creek screwed the ending because Morgan Creek, James, Jim Robinson, who was the producer, our same producer, said to William Peter Blatty, he said, well, where's the exorcism sequence? And they, they said, Blatty, who was directing it, said, there isn't one. And I love Exorcist 3. I think it's one of the scariest films you'll ever see. Yeah. One of the five very, scariest very, films. Very, very, very creepy stuff. It is just And then at the end, blam, hell opens up and you've got the exorcism. That was never meant to be there. Morgan Creek apparently said, look, we want an exorcism, and forced him to have that sequence. Right. So the thing is... Very if you jarring, look, considering the sort of psychological oh, kind of creepy build-up and people scuttling Brad, across the Brad ceiling. Brad in classic form. Just, just, oh, that, you know. Yeah. And I, you, you watch it in the cinema, and every time when that woman comes out with the shit, or you know, chubby, everybody mm. screams. Yeah. That is the most stunning static camera scene in film history, probably. Mm. But the thing is, we had the same producer, and he did the same thing. He said, well... Clive, uh, uh, people might like the monsters. And Clive said, yes. And he didn't like it. Right. And he said, no, 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 no. The monsters, the bad guys. And Clive said, no, the monsters are a microcosm of society. They're good, bad, male, female, straight, gay, black, white, blah, blah, everything. But this is the whole, this is the the whole, whole point, point of idiom. Of the thing. <laughs> it's the monsters of the psychiatrists and the police, the people yeah. we might trust the most, saying not they're all bad, but the thing is, this is the reversal of the roles. Yeah. Midian is just simply society. It's just squeezed down into people who might look slightly different. Our attitudes towards disability, to sexuality, everything is included in this film. Yeah. And and that was the idea of the original script. And that just didn't get through and to the production. And they trashed it. Oh, it got through and they didn't like it. So they <laughs> trashed it. So they gave Cronenberg more people to kill. They put more blood and guts in and changed the ending. Right. And because now we have Nightbreed the Cabal Cut that's some way redressed the balance to going back to what it should have been. Sure. To which is a movie about that whatever you look like, whatever you are, that you should be happy with what you are and that you shouldn't be oppressed or whatever because of the way you look. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful film to make a point on that level. It's what science fiction fantasy does so well, is to actually make points about the way we live now, the way our attitudes are. The great distraction of the the visual, which is, yeah, Yeah. a good hook. And it looks pretty good. You know, overall, we had some big sets. I mean, God, you know, Steve Hardy, that, that Midian set that was about three stories high yeah. that was expanded by a wonderful miniature sequence that most people look at and can't tell the difference between the two when the car goes down through the middle of the thing. And some lovely stuff. Charles Hay doing his gunslinging police sergeant. Cronenberg. Actually, I like him every time I see him. I was sort of thinking, oh, he's not an actor when you first saw it, but actually that quiet, yeah. underplayed yeah, that, quiet that he voice. does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And because I got to meet him and have lunch with him one day, you know, one of my heroes, you know, he's like, wow. <laughs> um, but it was just... 
it was an interesting film to work on. It was tiring. Yeah. Because we had about, it was really about four, nearly five months shoot. And we'd That's been, a very long we'd shoot. been nearly eight months in the workshop building up to it. <laughs> and you mentioned before that whole thing about sort of like about working on a stage and working in a workshop. Yeah. Is I, 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 I always found is the thing is that with the pre production, towards the end of pre, you'd get, oh, get me on a set, get me on a set. And then towards the end of the shoot, you say, oh, God, next picture, workshop. please, into the workshop. And, and, and that was shot at Pinewood, so mm, you, yeah. you, geographically your workshop wouldn't be that far from where you were filming, no, no, which is always a joy when that yeah, happens. Yeah, it doesn't always walked, happen, especially nowadays. I'm trying to think, they were shooting um, Aliens, okay. Alien, and no, Alien 3. Alien 2. Yeah, Aliens. Alien 2, yes, Aliens. And they were shooting Alien 3, that's it, in 1990 when I finished there, when we were doing Highlander 2. So there was so much, so much of the stuff going on, you know, amalgamated. What a time to be at Pinewood, man. Yeah, You're back yeah. then. Yeah. <laughs> and then everybody and was there. You know, Gina Acevedo was there working for amalgamated, dynam- amalgamated Dynamics, you know, all the people there, et cetera, et cetera. And then lots of our crews, we let them go and walk over to our, you know, and go and start working there. Mm. So there was lots going on. Um, and Pinewood, I mean, it still is, but was, you know, at, at, at that time, those sort of 10 years where it's, it's real big time when they were making yeah. big films. I think those were... Probably the years that, you know, I was at an age where, you know, monsters and stuff. I always liked monsters and creatures, but that was a time where those things really mm. hit. And I was buying Fangoria magazine. And this is where I found out about, you know, image animation through those kinds of films and well, seeing articles about that sort yeah, of stuff. But it's also, she said, it's before the advent of CG. It was, it was. And whilst I'm not totally anti-CG at all, it, it's, a, it's a tool. Yeah. When it's used as the tool for the right job, fabulous. Um but I mean, what was it? Jurassic Park '93 was that that point where people started to realise that CG was something that you could actually do something instead of building a big Tyrannosaurus that wouldn't move and walk along the floor. You could actually do something. Oh, yeah. And it's gone beyond that, obviously, where it's just the thing that you go to straight off. But the thing is that we were sort of like working with uh, what's it, uh, Cliff Culling, that the opticals, you know, at Pinewood. Mm-hmm. Um, some of their stuff was fabulous, and they, you know, their company goes back to the fifties. You know, they were doing map paintings. You know, watching Cliff map paint. It's just map paintings. I remember, I remember as a ch- as a boy, about eighteen and nineteen, I went to a lecture by Albert Whitlock at the National Film oh Theatre, where he did a full lecture and he showed you, brought along a couple of glass paintings. And then showed you, um, had a whole showreel that showed the painting, then the holes with the black, and then it fitted into the film with a little optical kicks off for things like Earthquake and things like that, which was just fascinating. And I thought, God, I wish I could paint. It was one of those options I was thinking of when I was doing model building and uh, makeup and matte yeah, painting yeah, and that yeah. kind of stuff. And there's a technique to it that people don't realise. Now, with, with CG matte painting, it's... I'm sure it's quite difficult, but it's all in 3G and 3D, sorry. Um, you know, so you can move around it. When you've got paintings, you look at, you remember the, the, the fabulous one at the end of, um, um, that Pangrazio did at the end of Die Hard mm-hmm. with the planes, or the one at the end of um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh God, and so people these stuff. days don't understand that you couldn't hold on a matte painting for more than a couple of seconds without seeing a brush stroke or something, mm-hmm. and that you kick something in. But the one at the end of Die Hard is, a, what, 15 seconds before it fades out? And little holes where they've got people moving that they shot into it and you look at it and think how do you paint like the, the ones in earthquake how do you paint buildings with straight lines and you've got your stick and you're doing this and this people don't get those things yeah, these yeah. days i also think there was a certain amount of because you didn't have the ability to do anything if there was enough money you could do anything there were limitations to things i think there was a certain amount of acceptance of like this is what we're going to film. Yes. And you don't change your bloody oh, mind yeah. five minutes before. Yeah. Whereas now it's like, let's build an entire 3D environment because we might want to change our minds later. For, yeah. So that, that, that option to always be flexible is always there. And I think that, that it, makes for lazy filmmaking in a way because then people are not yeah. prepared to make decisions on set as much. It's interesting because the thing is that the one thing I hate... All right, I don't hate, but I dislike about lots of modern films that use a lot of CGI environments is it gives the person the ability to fly anywhere they like. And the problem is, somebody somebody actually wrote it down. I said, that's what I've been thinking, is the thing is that the best stuff is when you do it, shoot it from a human perspective. Mm -hmm. And as people can't go, whiz round in circles, etc., it just upsets that sense of reality. And once you've seen a city sort of like being destroyed in 3D, whizzing round it a hundred times, it just gets boring. Mm. And what we had to do is we shot it in sections. It takes me back to a thing that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, do you know the one, the TV I one? do, I do. Carry on, I've got something interesting to show you in a second. Okay, oh, carry on. No, no, okay. no, it's good, it's Mr. Good. Potato Head, as he was called by the Daily Mirror, I think it was. Um, 
It was an interesting project for, I can't remember the name of the director. The director had done two or three big TV historical things. And it was for American TV. And the problem with American TV was they liked their stuff well lit. They did it those times. Now it's become much more arty and you can get away with darker stuff. Mm. So everything was going to be well lit. And he came to us and Bob was doing something else. John was doing Chimera. I was doing Dr. Jekyll, I think it was, or something like that. I remember that. Chimera. Yeah, TV thing. Mm-hmm. And I was doing this. And we had a budget, minimal budget. Um, and he said, I want to do uh, an uncut transformation. I want to have the camera standing there, just looking at this guy, and he goes, and transforms. And I said... Ugh. I mean, the budget for American Wealth in London was pretty big, and they had cutaways. Yes. And I said to him, <laughs> now, you and I both know, to me, you may be the same, the greatest transformation sequence in film history Lon is Cheney. American Werewolf. Oh, I was going to think that Lon Chaney, when he, you know, with the light, well, that was pretty yes, good. Yes, <laughs> okay. You go back, and again, I was looking at some stuff on Day Online. It's the thing is the, 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 the Abbott Costello to, you know, to oh, Frederick March I do copy love that. that where well, you're just using simple dissolves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing is that, but to me, American Werewolf works not because it's low budget, but because they use what's called film grammar. They edit. That if I did a shot of you, if this was being filmed, yeah. there'd be nothing as boring yeah, as watching no. my head just sitting here talking from the same angle. So you cut to long shots, close up side shots. Yeah. The classic, we now have all those shots of the film of the camera filming the person. Yeah. The long shot, the cuts of films while I'm talking. You've got to keep people interested. It did. I mean, that was the thing. I mean, the effects on that shot were uh, in American Werewolf, the transformation. They were fantastic, but they were also engaging because it was quite voyeuristic because yes. each shot was very carefully selected. Yes. It was storyboarded. It was storyboarded, and you, ha- you but, felt, but you felt you were being carried along with it. You were like being exposed to things, like when his hand first yeah. Elon Gates. Yeah. But you never, just, felt short, horrendous. you never felt short change in terms of the effect because yeah. you didn't care that you cut. No. Now, David, the director, wanted to have one long sequence, and I said, saying, well, I said, look, it's just this brightly lit shot of this man going, Ugh. it's going back to the old days when we used to do cross dissolves and you could see the eyes move, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. which was what they used and what they had. And I said, if you look at American Wolves, still then, certainly, but I still think now one of the greatest transformations is the thing is you're using sort of like different cutaways and you get tension, etc. And that means we can do cutaways to this and this and this and this. And we can, I said, he said, no, I want that. I want that. I want that. I, want, I don't get, you can afford that. You can afford that. So we came up with an idea. We sat there, me, Chris Fitzgerald and John sat there and came up with this idea that we basically would have Michael Caine standing there in front of camera on a locked off chair and he would go, screw his face up and go, and we would get in a certain point to go, whip his face across and that would create a bit of blur. Right. So during the point, what I'd say, what we'll try and do is we're going to then do a puppet head of Michael Caine the thing is that in that position, so we went into Michael's house, we photographed him, John, uh, Chris Fitzgerald, no, it's John did the, did the Michael Caine head, a gorgeous sculpt of Michael Caine going, ah, like that, and then we'll put bladders in it, okay, and bits and pieces, and I also uh, copied one of Dick Smith's techniques they used for spasms, where you put trichloroethomethane into foam, and oh, it, and it swells. swells up, yep, yep, yep. you did it beautifully in spasms, yes. Um, so we did that. We copied the technique. We didn't do the cuts, but we wanted his face to swell. So we did that on a foam head, and there's me, all, me and John underneath, completely covered in polythene to make sure we don't get touched by this stuff, pumping this stuff. The head starts to bulge up in certain places. Then we're going to hand puppeteering this head, going, ah, 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 and stop. Ah, ah, ah. Then whip a grin. We'll cut again then to a bladdered head that pops up and blah, 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 all this kind of thing. Then it starts going down a bit, and then we do whip it again. We cut to a Mr. Hyde head with bladder. Then a Mr. Hyde head with trichlorothermethane, and then to the makeup. Was this in front of like a green screen or no? No, well, no, blue it was a dark background, dark just background. a dark background in a little corner of a soundstage in Pinewood. And I said it might work because it didn't. That's work. the best I can give you. It didn't work <laughs> because the okay. thing is, it would have taken not a formidable editor, but a good editor and a good effects sort of like they didn't have the budget for the optical printing, all that kind of thing. Sure, sure. And they said we can't work. And I. I, said, I kept saying, that I, I said, I don't think this will work, but this is the best idea we've got between me, Chris, and John. This is what we, we, this is what we think we can do. Right. And I was unceremoniously fired from the picture. <laughs> um, not, yeah, just I said, look, just Jeff, Bob said, just, I wouldn't come in today, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, they're a bit pissed off. And I, Bob knew where I was coming from. John sort of said, look, we told them right at the beginning, we're not sure this will work. This is the best we can do for this budget. Mm. They then gave him another 20 grand and they went back and did it exactly the way I said they should have done it in the first place. 
with, with cut away, away with cutaways so blood is on hands blood is on faces bits and pieces some are our puppet heads thrown in there lots of cuts 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 cuts, cuts and it made a perfectly reasonable sequence for the transformation yeah and had they done it the way we said that in the first place they'd have got a bloody amazing transformation sequence and there was then, you know, and that was a nice film to shoot on. It was great to work with Michael Caine, et cetera, et cetera. The makeup was interesting. I tried to I tried to do something different. I went for a baby. I said if the guy's being reborn Maybe let's give be a baby. Give, give him we gave him baby teeth, we gave him baby hands, sort of like stumpy hands, and this what thing that came out looking like a potato head, which you have a picture of obviously. I think I've got um, uh, I've actually I tell you it came out in the newspaper. Yes. I think the mirror and the sun. The mirrors do a, did a cartoon and called it Mr. Potato Head or something because he looked like a, Mr. Potato Head. I hope it is anyway. It but, worked um, quite nicely. It wasn't awful, but it was interesting. Yeah. It was all new. And he had, I didn't want to do, I mean, the Frederick March Mr. Hyde is classic, but I always thought, why did he change into Virtue a Gorilla? My favourite Mr. Hyde is the Spencer Tracy. Oh my God. Do, you, do you know that one? Yeah, yeah. Because that's subtle, and that that when Spencer Tracy's when in they that did makeup, the light change thing. It's the light change mm-hmm. thing with the shadows and the and the different coloured makeups, but then minimal prosthetics. And when he leers, and he's got the same teeth. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it's just you know, it's yeah. an it. We tried to get a babyish look to it, and it was interesting. But you know. It's it's it has a, it to me it's with the lenses and that we give him big baby eyes etc and he's got an interesting look to it yeah um, and I thought it worked quite nicely and with his performance in it was fabulous he had a nasty look a misshapen baby type look yeah yeah um, but the thing is it's just sort of like that it was in full light all the time and it was a standard TV soap opera costume drama type thing and whilst there were some good bits to it it just didn't really do that much but yeah it's a shame sometimes it happens. Yeah, yeah. You put everything into it and, totally. you know, nothing and happens. And other times you, you do something well, off, off cuff and it ends up being a, a hit yeah. and you can't know. I know what it. I know. we did the best job we could. Chris, Chris Fitzgerald did some gorgeous sculpts for the sort of the middle, middle stages. And we all came up with the idea between us. And we all said, look, this is what we did. We did the best we could. And we know, we know that the, uh, one of the other producers came to us afterwards and said, look, I'll let you in a little secret. David rang up ILM after he finished, because he was so miffed, apparently, that we'd spent £50,000 of his money <laughs> on the transformation How much do you work. think they charged me? <laughs> and he rang up ILM, and they said, well, basically, fifty grand you probably get to come over for the day and talk to you about it. He said, for a transformation like that, if you wanted it straight through with all the optimals, you'd be looking a million minimum. And he said, he said David sort of thought, hmm, Perhaps, perhaps it perhaps I was a bit harsh. <laughs> no, of course not. No, don't, don't so do you that. didn't get any wine through the post? Like, <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't, you know, I've done enough stuff now where you, you know, you always want to do your best. You know, it's if you do yeah. a job, what's the point in not doing your best? Yeah, quite right. Um, then the thing is, you know, it, it's that simple. So that's it for the first part. Uh, part two, like I say, will be up next week. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to us on iTunes or uh, any podcast directory and uh, keep the feed going so you don't miss anything. Also, just to remind you that we'd love to hear from you. Feedback is always welcome. And normally uh, we're looking at solutions to problems. Uh, we've done an interview this time around, but normally we're just looking at how to fix problems that crop up. Hence the podcast being uh, called Battles with Bits of Rubber, because that's pretty much what we do. So if you do have any technical questions or anything you want to hear, uh, maybe even feature as a podcast episode, because if we get good questions, which we often do, it's nice to include them in the podcast and uh, maybe even something that we'll include uh, with video or uh, a tutorial tutorial or something as well because if you've got that question there's a good chance somebody else somewhere will have the same question and it's uh, it's 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 good to find out these things and uh, and share your experiences our email is stuart and todd at gmail.com so we've had a couple of good questions um we've answered a lot in email form uh but uh, there's a fair few that i think are probably worth sharing so i'm just going to read out a few here we've got one from uh, michelle pennington i think that's right is it michael or michel michel pennington uh he writes uh, hello Stuart and todd that was a great podcast on live casting i have one quick question i understand the need for accurate live cast but other than removing bubbles, uh, fixing nostrils and other imperfections, why is it that we have to shave down the cast piece? Shouldn't things be super accurate when they're done? If there can be these discrepancies, where do they come from? Can it be so truly different to the point that the prosthetic doesn't fit? I'm answering some of these questions in my head, but I would like to know a little bit more so I can either avoid it or minimize it or learn through some other processes. Okay, that's a very good question, Michel. And uh, basically, I have replied to him in the email, but I wanted to uh, just... Uh, 
chat about it as well because I think it's uh, it's a good question. It's it's something that uh, crops up a lot sometimes when people uh, are dealing with a face cast, and then there are things you do to it. And I do actually appreciate it, Michelle, that you took the time to get in touch. I say shaving down, that would suggest that like a wholesale smoothing of the whole surface, like you're, you know, you're trying to smooth it all down to like a billiard ball kind of smoothness. Um, uh, and you're correct that the whole point in taking a life cast is to record as accurate a copy of the body part or face, whatever, uh, as possible. And often there are these artifacts which you unintentionally uh, create through air bubbles in the alginate or seam lines if you've done a back and a half uh you know a two half uh two two pieces of, of a cast you end up with a seam line um and these inaccuracy or these you know artifacts they were never part of the person but they were acquired incidentally through the casting process so that's why those need to be gotten rid of but the main artifacts uh, i think that you'll come across with life casting are things like the bulge of hair underneath a ball cap because obviously when you've got your plaster head out this will appear as a solid lump of plaster um, yet real hair would crush flat and smooth if you pressed it down but obviously during the casting process you're sort of putting material on it's kind of hanging off so um, that often uh, doesn't really um, happen so we usually measure the head circumference with a tailor's tape to measure and then uh, we know the dimensions of the head with the hair flattened down. So then uh, often what will happen is you'll shave back the plaster head to make sure it is the correct size of the head and not the size of the volume of hair in plaster which can be much bigger than the actual head underneath. The caveat of that is that on occasion you do sometimes shrink cores down, uh, especially bodies or limbs, uh, to make a piece really snug. Um, often, especially with silicon, because silicon stretches so well, but it doesn't compress great, it, you, but it does readily stretch. Um, it's often a good idea to actually make things smaller than you need so that it's tight, um, so that it, it has a better fit and doesn't appear baggy. Um, kind of like how Lycra or Spamex compression tops, they always look very, very small when you see them on the hangers, but actually when you put them on, because they stretch so much, they, you know, they, they'll, they'll fit. And it's kind of like that with the, with a lot of silicon things. Typically things like masks or suits where it's like a big one piece thing because you have to stretch it so much to get it on. If you actually make it the size of the head, by the time you've done that, it tends to be a little bit baggy because it stretches so much. So often you will shave a head down or actually reduce the core. Maybe you lay some clay inside the mold so that when the head comes out, it's actually slightly smaller than the original head. Uh, so the features and everything are the same, but the actual volume of the head or maybe the the um, you know the circumference of the neck is reduced so that the piece is then smaller. So that the, the final silicon piece then pops on is actually a snug fit. Uh, and it just looks better and it moves better because it's actually, you know, clinging to the skin rather than, you know, uh, sitting on there like a big baggy sack. We have another great question from a guy called Mark Petrie. So thank you, Mark, for getting in touch. Mark says, hi there. Um, I'm a complete novice to sculpting and I have been watching your skin texturing video over and over again. I bought some Prima Plastiline from uh, the Sculpture House, but the clay seems to be much too soft to create those really fine details that you're showing in your video. Uh, the clay seems quite sticky. I was expecting it to be more like a wax, but it's definitely not that. It says that it's a medium hardness, but I think the plastiline that you used in your video is a medium hardness. Anyway, it's too warm in my home, maybe, where I'm trying to work. Do you think I should use a harder clay if I'm working in a warmer environment? Um, I wouldn't know because I'm in England and it's never warm here. No, that's not true. Um, I think basically the answer to that is yes. If you're finding, because plastilines are by definition waxy, oily materials, they tend to soften with heat. So if where you are happens to be warm, you work in a warm, a warm workshop or a warm environment, then it's going to soften the plastiline. So regardless of what they're calling it, because obviously the name, you know, medium, hard, whatever, is, is kind of subjective. There isn't necessarily a kind of a strict guideline as to what things are going to be called. So what might be, you know, medium someplace may be hard to somebody else or if they've got sort of weaker fingers or something. So it kind of depends on you know, variables. So I would take all that with a pinch of salt, really. What I would say is that it's probably worth you actually handling materials. I know you're going to find suppliers online are cheaper, um, typically, but that denies you the opportunity of actually handling a material if you're not familiar with it. So I would urge you to try and go to either trade shows or to stores where they actually sell it and actually sort of get your hands on these things and squeeze them and work them, you know, get a ball of it in your hands and uh, try and work it and see how it looks and how it feels so that you have a you know a very uh, realistic idea of how it how it works for you because it's going to be different and to, to different people 
Um, I mean, the, the clay that I like to use or the plastic I like to use is uh, stuff called, um, the, it's made by J Herbin, H-E-R-B-I-N. Uh, I can put a link to it in the uh, in the blog post details. Um, but basically it's, uh, and in the show notes, it's basically a grey, well, it comes in grey and ivory, but I tend to get the grey because the ivory shows up every bit of dirt and grease, you know, that your fingers pink up in a workshop. Um I tend to work with a grey, and I work with a, a grade called 55. They do a 50 and a 55. I think they go down to 45, which is the softest, and it goes up to about 70, 75, I think, which is the hardest. Um, anything above 55, I find, is too firm for me to work. Um, so I tend to work with, you know, a softer plastiline if I can. Um, there are, of course, one, one of the most uh, well-known clays that we use is, uh, is, is called Monster Clay. Well, I really like Monster Clay. I think it's really, really nice. And they've recently brought out, I think, three different hardnesses now. So there's a firm, a medium, and a soft. And I think it was always available in the medium range that they have. But I have found, particularly in colleges where we're working with people who are a bit younger or they just don't have the finger strength because they're not, you know, rock climbers or whatever, or they don't scold all the time. But they have found that working with Monster Clay as a standard grade was quite firm. Um, I quite like it, and I, I like the firmness of it. But um, some people found it too firm to work. And I know that you can heat it up in a in a microwave, but it cools very quickly, especially if you're working on plaster, because as soon as you put the molten material onto uh, onto your core to start sculpting, it, it cools again and, and returns to its normal state. So if you want something that is softer, it makes sense to to get a softer plastiline. But um, yeah, if you are working in a warm environment and you're finding the softness is so soft that you can't actually get. Uh, the detail that you want, especially the finer detail, then it's worth switching to a firmer plastiline. Um, I think that's one of the good things about um, monster clay, that they really have that advantage being a firmer kind of clay. I mean, you can melt it to liquid to brush it in and pour it into molds. But once it's kind of cools and, and goes a lot harder, you can really work it, you know, quite fiercely. And uh, and you get a, a much uh, different finish, especially for the finer detail. So for that kind of stuff, it's really, really good. So uh, I would check out uh, maybe uh, monster clay as well if you can't find something easily. It also depends where you are. I mean, I found in Europe, England and stuff, the, the, the Herbin stuff is quite popular and well-known. Uh, outside of that area, especially in the States, it tends to be harder. You get a lot more Chavant and, and Monster Clay use because that's just what you can get your hands on easily. Um, so uh, I would say yes for you, um, definitely, Mark. It might be worth trying out just a firmer plastic see if you can get something that's a bit firmer. So thanks very much for your emails and questions. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, please do get in touch. Like I say, our email address again is stuartandtodd at gmail.com. And uh, just to uh, mention the last podcast we did, which was all about the coloring, silicon coloring, that is a tie-in with uh, an article that we wrote for the Prosthetics Magazine, which is um, out now, issue, issue number three. Um, it's worth checking out Prosthetics Magazine if you can. There's a Facebook, Facebook group um uh, just called Prosthetics Magazine. Check it out. It's got loads of stuff in it. It comes out maybe four or five times a year. The reason it doesn't come out that often is because uh, the the idea is to just pack it with stuff. So each time it comes out, it's filled with stuff. It's not just padding, uh, you know, to, to fulfill like a, a weekly or monthly schedule. It's actually released when there's a decent amount of stuff coming out. So it's well worth checking out. So hopefully I shall speak to you soon. Please, like I say, get in touch. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening.